And of course, if anyone comes in, they can feel free to take a seat and we'll go from there. Uh, my name is Scott Teeters. I am. Go ahead. Just one minute. We'll just introduce you. Yes. Okay. Oh, he's. Sorry, I misunderstood. No, tell who you are. We shook hands. <laughs> <laughs> we really did. We did. Yeah, I know. <laughs> How you doing? I, for those who don't know me, I met Casey. I'm the, the president down in the Archival Group. We have with us Walter Avery, who's the president here in German. And we'd also thank, like to thank Proof Smallcomb, who worked with Dale to get the arrangement so that we had a larger area to have the talk tonight. And we're glad to have with us two people who are connected with the 8th Camp, Camp, Pennsylvania Camp. Museum, Camp, 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 but there were yeah, a Camp. museum mm -hmm. at the Scranton um, City Hall that's open on the third week of every month, third Saturday of every month? Typically. Yes, Typically. he's going to explain I, that. I'm going to explain that in a minute. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay. And we have Joe Long yes, okay, with us, and Scott Teeter, who's mm -hmm. going to be presenting the program. And again, we welcome them for coming tonight and sharing with us. Thank you guys very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I, as, I, as he mentioned, I am uh, Scott Teeters. I am presently the chaplain for our camp, and I'm going to discuss what a camp is and, and so on here in just a moment to kind of make this all make sense because otherwise it's just a lot of chatter. Uh, but at this time, I am the chaplain for Camp Number 8, uh, Department of Pennsylvania, Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War. All right. At this time, I'm also serving as the department chaplain for the entire state of Pennsylvania, and I serve as the chaplain for all men that are part of this organization for the entire state. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things that I do is, I, one of the things I'm doing presently, and I'll just mention this quickly, I'm doing some research on uh, chaplaincy and uh, uh, how the chaplains function during the Civil War. It's a little different than what we have today. Now, I, how many of you folks have served in the United States military? Okay, so quite a few of you, okay? You may have had reason to come in contact with a chaplain during your service. Um, the chaplaincy today is considerably different. And uh, uh, so I'll just mention to you that it's something I'm personally studying. I know because you're all historians, you study different things, whatever it is that interests you. The beauty of coming together like this is we're gonna be talking about things that we're interested in, Joe and I, but we're hoping that by talking about these things with you, you may be telling us some things that you're aware of, maybe from the Mid-Valley area here, uh, about the Civil War. This is all very, very beneficial to us. So one thing I'd like to mention here from the beginning, while we're discussing here, if you have a question, something comes up that you want to ask a question about, please raise your hand right away and we'll stop. This is a more informal talk because we, at, at, truthfully, we're all historians here. So our, our intent here today is not just to teach, but to learn. So if we have that opportunity, we'd like to take advantage of it. So there, there's, you're not going to be disrupting anything if you raise your hand. We're going to stop, we'll deal with the question you have, and then we'll go back to what we're doing. Uh, Brother Joe is with us here too, and uh, as you know, he's a, uh, as you can tell, he was, uh, he was raised with Moses. And uh, <laughs> I can only say that in front of people that know stuff about history. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Brother Joe has learned so many things over the years, and I count him as a dear friend as, and as a resource for the things that I'm studying. The things that he's going to talk about tonight are so diverse that uh, it will probably boggle your mind. Uh, the good thing is he knows what he's talking about because a lot of what you see here is his personal collection. Now, we as the Sons of Union Veterans also have a museum in Scranton in the basement of City Hall. Now, if you know where City Hall is in Scranton, on the corner of Mulberry and Washington Street, uh, that's where we're located. Now, I need to mention something here in case you're thinking about coming down. At this point, we are temporarily closed. Uh, if you noticed in the paper, there's been discussion about a problem with the elevator in the uh, City Hall and that they're doing repairs on it. In order for them to be able to f functionally deal with folks that need uh, have ambulatory problems can't get up the stairs they had to move some of the offices to the basement where people can get up the ramp and get in they asked us to vacate one of our rooms which meant we had to pack everything we have into two rooms which means that uh, temporarily we are closed uh, we are expecting to open back up in november and we would welcome each of you to come we are typically open the third uh, the now, now listen carefully the saturday 
after the third Thursday of the month. And there's a reason for that. Uh, our group meets every month, and we meet on the third Thursday of the month. At that time, we discuss with each other who's going to be there to service the museum on that following Saturday. That's why it is. So we can't say it's always the third Saturday, because it isn't. All right. Having said that, let me explain a little bit about our organization, and I'll make this very brief. Um, the Sons of Union Veterans are actually the, uh, uh, we came after the Grand Army of the Republic. And the Grand Army of the Republic were the, uh, the men that fought in the Union Army and were honorably discharged. Uh, there were posts all over this area. Maybe you know where there was one locally here. I don't know, where's the, where's the closest post to where Peckville, we... Peckville had a post. Okay, Peckville had a post, for instance. There was a post in Scranton, post 139. Our camp, camp number eight, is the descendant of post 139. And of course, all the Civil War veterans have now gone on to their eternal rewards, so they're not here anymore. Uh, in the, uh, the United States government at one point deeded over all the holdings of the Grand Army of the Republic to the Sons of Union veterans of the Civil War. So we are the legal entity and the legal heirs to the uh, Grand Army of the Republic. That doesn't uh, necessarily bring something with it always, but in our case, uh, we also have the holdings of the museum. So we have a lot of what you see here only many times over. Uh, we also have a lot of documentation in the museum. So if you get the chance to come or if you're doing research, we may have some of the documents you're not going to find somewhere else. That's one of the things that we bring to the general public. And of course, we're always looking for new members, as I'm sure you folks know what this is like in your own organization. You're always looking for new members, people that are interested in the subject and want to do uh, some sort of research. So that is certainly open to any of you that would be interested in joining. For the men, you would join the Sons of Union Veterans. For the ladies, you would join one of the allied orders for the ladies. The men and women do meet separately, uh, but we have a common cause. Having said that, are there any questions I can answer specifically about the Grand Army of the Public or the Sons of Union Veterans before we kick off here? Because obviously you came here to see what's up here. Yes, sir? The GAR building is in Scranton. Yes. They're completely separate organization. That originally was our building, okay. the one that's on Penn and Linden Street. Right. Right. That originally was our building, and uh, that was sold, what, in the 80s, I believe? That was sold in the early 80s. The GAR bought it in 1904, and uh, the Sons of Union Veterans almost went out of existence in Scranton when I first joined the camp. And as when I joined the camp, they were just selling the building. They couldn't maintain it. So that's why they sold it. And it's a shame that it had to be sold, but it was, it, the roof was leaking and they just didn't have the money. And uh, an architect bought it. Then the architect sold it to a, a lawyer. A lawyer and the lawyer wanted $700 a month off us to stay there, and we couldn't afford it. So the mayor allowed us to go into the old police station at City Hall, thank God. Yeah, we have a, we have a, a lease with the city for that for a, for a very <coughs> nominal fee, uh, which works out very well for us, because really we don't, we're not a money-making entity by any stretch of the imagination. No, we don't so charge you. The museum that's there is now Right, so if you're familiar with the museum that was on Penn and Linden, this is the, the beauty of what we have today, and we're very thankful for it, is we have a little bit more space, so we have room to put out things that used to be in storage. Okay, We still do have some things in storage because we still don't have quite enough room to get everything out, but we uh, have a lot of the documentation, the research materials are out, and like I said, that is available to the public on the days that we're open. We'll be happy to work with you if that's something you need. We have worked with uh, some of the local universities. We have worked with the University of Scranton. We have worked with Marywood, I think. They're the ones that did. They did some work for us a few years ago, uh, and we're very thankful for that. But the museum itself is, uh, is open to the general public, and there is no charge for uh, coming to visit. Do you have to be a, a descendant of a vet to become a member? No, uh, there, is a di there is a difference. We do allow associate members, and they have all the same privileges. Uh, the only difference is what? They can't hold a department uh, commander's job. Okay, so they, they, can move, they can hold just about every position except the department commander, which is uh, over the state of Pennsylvania. But that's really the only difference. 
Uh, their badges look a little different. Their badge will be solid blue here. Uh, the uh, ribbon will be solid blue. Mine is red, white, and blue because I do have an ancestor uh, that fought at the Battle of Antietam. And uh, obviously, if you do research and you find your relatives, you're welcome to join as a, as a full member, and that's certainly fine. But uh, we would welcome anybody that would like to be involved. It, it's, uh, it's a good organization. It does give you access to some things that you wouldn't necessarily get some other way. So uh, it, it is a good thing if that's something you're interested in. All right. Uh, that being said, oh yes, sir. Go ahead. One other question. Go ahead. If you find, because I already have, I have a relative that deserted mm -hmm. the Civil War. Is that like grounds for not being able to join as long as they're like honorable? I don't know. What happened during the Civil War? A lot. You'll you'll, you'll read in the uh, five volume set of the regimental history mm -hmm. of Pennsylvania. A lot of you'll see in there, it says deserted. Mm -hmm. What happened is a lot of men on the march got captured, fell out, were killed, mm -hmm. uh, taken prisoner, and they didn't, uh, and after this, these books were printed, then some of them tried to join the GAR, so they did research, they got a lot of their buddies that was in the same outfit with them and a lot of these guys, they come to find out they didn't desert. It's, it's just like any, any, you know, if you get taken prisoner on a retreat, some people thought they deserted, some didn't. Okay. All right, that being said, Joe, I'd like to turn this over to you for, to go ahead and begin. And uh, Joe's gonna, basically the way this is gonna work, he's gonna start at one side and work his way this way. Uh, I'll be talking about the, uh, the firearms and the projectiles that are here, and then he'll pick back up again and take that table all the way down to the other end. Anytime I'm talking about these artifacts, raise your hand if you have a question. All of these artifacts are original artifacts. First thing I'd like to say, we have a book here. And in our museum, we have over 400 pictures of Civil War soldiers from the Lackawanna all the way up to Carbondale. Have a seat, please. So if you'd like to go through this, I have the ages, the J's. Right here, this is my great-grandfather's discharge. He was in the 132nd Pennsylvania <coughs> from uh, Naog, Pennsylvania, is where he lived, which is right up near Elmhurst. It doesn't exist today. The homes are tore down. They built the bridge across the gully. But he carried this back, marched down Lackawanna Avenue. And when I was a little boy, I asked my aunt if I could have it. and. Uh, in 1960, I was able to get it. Oh. I also have a picture of my great-grandfather and my great-grandmother. His name was Martin Wilmore. And she died in 1928, and she was getting a pension check of $30 a month at that time. And that was a lot of money. That fed, fed you and uh, paid your rent. This is the old GAR hall, and in there, they're in a formation. And if you look here, they had colored Civil War soldiers in the GAR in Scranton. And the one gentleman here is named Merriweather. Joe. Joe, can I hold that for a second? Sure. Good. Where was the old GAR hall? Uh, the old GAR was on Penn and Linden. Mm -hmm. But there was at several other GAR halls that they rented up until 1904, and then they bought their own building. Obviously, you're going to have the chance to come up afterward to see these things up close. Uh, I, let me take something here, Joe, real quick and mention something. The, the unusual thing about the GAR at the time, and you think back about the time this was occurring, the unusual thing about the GAR was this was the first integrated veterans organization. As long as you served honorably in the Union Army, you were welcome at a GAR post. And that's the reason why you see both 
uh, black and white soldiers here together because anyone that was honorably discharged was considered a brother. And as long as you could show your honorable discharge, you are welcome to join the post. And that's what the difference is. Joe mentioned it, that, that uh, notebook over there. And that notebook, if you look through it, you'll see we have pictures of, I believe, it's seven different uh, men that served with the United States Colored Troops, that's what they were called because they were segregated, and those men came back and joined the post here in Scranton, or the posts around there, and uh, we have some of their photographs and their names. Some of them we know about, some of them are kind of lost to history, but uh, that's something that's unusual about this particular organization, that it was completely integrated. There were several black soldiers in the Waverly Post of the Waverly, Pennsylvania. This is a piece of hardtack. Now, I forgot to bring the hardtack. My, my wife makes hardtack, just like Civil War hardtack. But this is an original piece of hardtack. And a square piece of this hardtack, if I was able to buy it, it would cost about $500 today, just to get a whole original piece. This is a Bible that a soldier carried at Fort Delaware and he was from Pittston, Pennsylvania, and this was his personal Bible that he carried. And his name's in there. He was from Pittston. That's up in Arrowsburg? Joe, oh, Fort Delaware up in Arrowsburg? No, Pittston, Pennsylvania. No, Fort Delaware you mentioned. No, down in uh, Delaware, Delaware, state of Delaware. They had a prison. Oh, okay, because there's a Fort Delaware up, up in North Arrowsburg, yeah. too, yeah. This is a picture of uh, Jenny Wade, who was killed, the only woman killed at Gettysburg. This is clay from her backyard, made into a Civil War canteen. Wow. This is a surgeon's knife, a government surgeon's knife. Mm. If you look, you could cut the wrist, roll the flesh back, turn it over, and saw the hand right off. This is oh my God. about um, 30 years ago, I had a chance almost to buy an original uh, surgeon's kit, but uh, the lady would not sell it to me. I tried to buy it, but uh, it has a, the other type of saw and everything in there. This is also good for cutting sandwiches. It's <laughs> tough, you can use this side. <laughs> this is a fork and spoon and a knife that they carry. It was a kit, yeah. It, it old kit. Yep. And uh, they would just wash it off in the stream and, uh, and uh, carry it. Now, I have some papers here. I normally have other papers, but I wasn't able to bring them. This is, uh, if you go to the cemetery in the Civil War plot, now they have one in the Dunmore Cemetery, the Forest yeah. Hill Cemetery, yeah. and the Cathedral Cemetery. And they do have another cemeteries in the valley. And uh, they have a plaque, it says, uh, the bivouac of the dead. And on this plaque that they have, it only gives you a little bit of the bivouac of the dead, and if you read it. This is the whole thing of the bivouac of the dead. So if you'd like to take a copy home with you, you're welcome to take this copy. Now, you all heard of uh, Captain DeLacy. He's a Medal of Honor winner from Scranton. This is a picture of him when he was a first sergeant. He got discharged as a first lieutenant. And uh, back in the 80s, and I went to the ceremony up at St. Catherine Cemetery in Moscow, uh, Congress made him a captain. He should have been discharged as a captain. So you, know, you hear his name, Captain DeLacy. Well, he got his promotion in the 1980s. His daughter, wow. uh, his daughter fought for it, but she was she died before he got it. This is uh, the 143rd Pennsylvania on Route 30 going west out of Gettysburg, and this is a monument. And this is Ben Crippen who was killed carrying the American flag and uh, they never found his body, but Captain DeLacy is right here. And this was taken in eight, 1889. Wow. This is a cap that was worn by a veteran from Post 
307, which is the Waverly Post. They had their own number post. <coughs> Whichever post you belong to, your number would appear on your hat. Mm -hmm. So if you see old pictures, you may have them in a collection or something, and you see a number, that number corresponds to a certain post. And if the documents still exist, uh, the roster documents still exist, you may be able to track that person down based on that information. Oh. This is a type of mirror they carry. It opens up and there you, what I would like to look in this mirror and, and see the first face that was put in here, you know, in this mirror. Yeah. But this is the type of mirror. And this is the type of drinking cup a lot of them was able to carry. <laughs> collapses and they get a little drink of water out of the well, collapse it, put it back in their blanket roll or their pack. In the early part of the war they used packs, but then the blanket rolls came after that. Is anybody here involved with Boy Scouts by chance? Anybody here have any experience with Boy Scouts? Bear small the, the, the boy The Boy Scouts actually, it, when I was in, in uh, actually in Cub Scouts, you could get a, a drinking cup like that, but it was made of plastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, today, today, that one there, you probably wouldn't have drink up because it's probably leaded. That was in the National Guard. We had a little, little oh, really? cup like yeah. that. Yeah. Girl, Scouts yeah. Girl Scouts too? Mm -hmm. These are Civil War matches, original Civil War matches. So if you get a chance, just take a look at them. Uh, most of what happened to these, they got a little wet or damp, and they were no good. But uh, I was able to get an actual that's great. This is a Confederate uh, savings bond or war bond. It's original. I bought this in Lexington, Virginia at Stonewall Jackson's home. Oh, let's see. What's the date here? I don't have the date, but it, it's, it's about 60 years ago I bought it. But uh, this is the bonds that, and they, they were uh, making fires out of these bonds when they were retreating. To, and uh, the union bonds, they of course cashed in and got their money for them. This here is Ezra S. Ripple. He was a mayor of Scranton. He was a prisoner of war. And uh, he, uh, you ever hear of the, uh, the Scranton Guard and, uh, 17, uh, 1877, they formed a Scranton Guard because of the strikes of the mines. He helped form the Scranton City Guard, but he was a mayor of Scranton. Was a ripple, yeah. He was actually also an author. He, he did write a book concerning yeah. his, uh, his time in captivity at the Andersonville prison and one other prison he got moved to at one point. I don't remember the second one. I did read the book, <clears throat> and up until a few years ago, I know it was still available for the, from the Historical Society in Scranton. This here is an original um, slave document. I have several of them over on the table. So if you get a chance, uh, you can read about uh, the price of some of the slaves and what they sold for. This is a flag, and we have the other portion of the flag in the museum, where 12 boys from Ohio were killed carrying this flag. 12 boys, 12 years, maybe 13 years old, they were killed. And we had this flag down there. That portion of the flag was not removed from the flag, it fell off. So we wouldn't, obviously wouldn't remove that from the flag intentionally, but it did fall off. We had several beautiful flags down there that were, that were falling apart, and we donated them to the state of Pennsylvania, Harrisburg, and they're able to preserve them. But, you know, they have flags, all the flags down there. Well, we gave them to Pennsylvania to save them. But this American flag, uh, it was falling apart, just rotting away. It was so old. Now we have Confederate money over there. I'm gonna go over that, but I have some other Confederate money. The, the oldest money I have here is a $3 bill, no, $5 bill, 1800. But that is what they call state's money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, the states had a lot more money. Uh, you're going to cover the card? Uh, I will as soon as you're done, Joe. If you're done with the All right, let's see what else I want to bring up here. It's my fourth. 
You might want to talk about the canteens, Joe. You're going to talk about, or you want me to? No, you should, because you know them better. Okay. But what I'm going to ask a lot of people here, do you know what flag this is? The rebel flag. The battle flag. Confederate flag. Battle flag. Battle flag. It, it, a lot of people think it's a Confederate flag. It's a Confederate battle flag. Confederate battle flag. This is the first Confederate flag. There were three of them. This is the second one. And the reason I did away with this one, it looked like a surrender flag. <laughs> and the third one was in March of 1865. And that is your Confederate flags. But don't think about, when you somebody says this is a Confederate flag, correct them, it's a Confederate battle flag. And the other one is the official Confederate flag, the one with the white stripe on it? This, this one is the last Confederate flag. This was a Confederate flag, This they changed it yeah. during the war, and this was the last one. This is a Confederate canteen found in the North End when Lee was pulling back from getting uh, from Fredericksburg in Spotsylvania, Cold Harbor, and this was found on the battlefield. Uh, these are not bullet holes. They used the bayonets to poke the soldiers to poke holes in them. But they're very rare. Some of the Confederate canteens were made out of wood. And you'll see a lot of Confederates carrying this type of canteen. This, they called it a bullseye canteen. Now this canteen is without a cover. And then I purchased this many years ago. What's unique about this is it still has the cork and it has the original cover. But then I was able to get an even better one. Here is one with the original strap. Now you don't find them with the strap. They're very rare. <coughs> wow. And that's the cover and everything. That's, but this cork I think is pretty well shot. Yeah, it's pretty well shot. But it, it's, it's nice, it's all original. I'm gonna let Scott take over. Uh, you can talk about the glasses and that too. Okay, I will do that. Okay. All right. Um, of course, uh, and I'm, I'm suspecting that uh, we've already established that some of you folks have served in the military, so you're familiar with firearms. Others of you may be familiar with firearms because you hunt or you shoot recreationally or something like that. The weapons that are here that you see, uh, some of them were quite advanced for their time. The one thing that you can remember from the Civil War is the fact that uh, at that point, at that juncture in man's development, uh, he had really developed ways to kill each other in unprecedented numbers. Now, there were several different firearms that you may have commonly come across on the battlefield uh, as a soldier. Now, as a Union soldier, you would have seen a rifle like this one. This is a Springfield rifle musket. Uh, uh, this one here, unfortunately, was broken at one point and it is taped together. But uh, we have several of these on display in our museum also. This was the most common weapon that a, a Union soldier would have carried. These weapons are single shot weapons. They are slow. For those of you that hunt maybe with a muzzle loader here in Pennsylvania, you know how slow they are because it's the same basic, item, uh, same basic idea. In this case, for those of you that have never seen this done, uh, there is a, these were shot something called a mini ball. It's not mini as an M-I-N-I, -I, as in miniature, that's not what this is. It actually, mini, it refers to the, the person that actually uh, came up with the idea. This was the first projectile that was made specifically to expand in the bore when the gas was, when the cartridge was fired, or the, uh, when the gun was fired and the lead would swell out to grab hold of the lands and grooves of the barrel and cause that projectile to spin. And just like throwing a football, like we see here on Friday night with the high school teams, when they throw a nice spiral pass, they can really get some accuracy with it uh, and some distance. Uh, this was the weapon that would have been very accurate on the battlefield uh, as much as possible with open sights and so on. When the, when the soldier was 
fighting on the battlefield, when he went to load this weapon, he would have a cartridge that looked like this. This is a remade cartridge here, but the idea is the same. It would have contained powder here where you see the white. There would have been a powder charge in there. And then, of course, the bullet here is in the front. You can see it's kind of a gray color. The soldier would have pulled this out of his bag, his cartridge box. This is a cartridge box here. I'm going to pick it up just slightly so you can see it. I'm sorry I have to turn my back to you for a second. This is a cartridge box. This is an original one. Sean, show him the original. Just open it up. Show him the original bullets in there. Um, okay. Well, let me put the rifle down now. I hate pointing this gun towards your head, Joe. I just I don't like you sitting there. I, I don't. I think you're sitting there. Uh, the box would go over your shoulder and would be on whichever side, left, right or left-handed. And the soldier, you'll notice there's a flap here. This would actually fasten shut so it wasn't flapping open when they were running. It would be lifted up like this. And this would be lifted up. Right. And inside of this area here were where your cartridges were kept. Your cartridges were kept separate fr from the caps or the percussion caps that actually set this off. They were in a different pouch for whatever, for, for reasons we can understand for safety. This is an original cartridge here. I'm sorry, let me turn it so you can see it. That's like original. This. That's original, that's a real original cartridge. It's amazing. The, the soldier would take that cartridge and he would clamp it in his teeth mm -hmm. and he'd tear the bottom off of it and pour all that gunpowder down the barrel. Then he would place the bullet on top, pointy side up. He'd place the bullet on here and use the ramrod. It does come out. To push that bullet all the way down on top of that powder and seat it tightly against the powder. When that powder was lit, it would create gas, which would force the projectile out the barrel. Once that bullet was fully seated, I'm glad this is his gun and not mine. <laughs> Once that bullet was fully seated, then in order to get the gun to go off, he had to place this at half cock. He had to pull this hammer back and place a percussion cap on here. It was, uh, it, for those of you that do shooting today with modern firearms, it would replace your primer. It's the same idea. And that would be placed on the nipple here, and then if it was time not to be in battle, he would place the hammer down on that percussion cap and leave it there until the time he needed to discharge his firearm. When it was time to discharge the firearm, he would pull the hammer all the way back like this, take his aim, pull the trigger, and the hammer would go forward, hit the cap, which would make a small fire, which would go down through a small nipple hole here, and set that charge off, the one that he had chewed and dumped in, that's what he set off. The gun would go poof, it'd make a lot of smoke, and uh, out the other end came a very, very heavy projectile. Now to put this in perspective, those projectiles were made of lead, they were very heavy. If I step back and threw it at your head, from here, it would really hurt. If you shot it out of this gun, it made a devastating okay. mess. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the, the weight of that bullet was sometimes in excess of 500 grains. Now to put that in perspective, for most of the people that hunt today in the area, maybe you hunt deer, the, the bullets that most people carry are probably no more than about 150 or 180 grains. So this bullet is literally four, or literally three times the weight of the average hunting rifle, and it's actually double the weight, or triple the weight, of the bullet that was carried by our soldiers during World War II. By the time you get to the Vietnam War and the issuance of the M16, the bullet weight had dropped all the way down to 55 grains. So literally, the bullets that were shot out of this firearm in the Civil War battlefield were five times as heavy as the bullets that are typically carried by the average soldier today. Okay. That's the difference in technology that you see. Something, something interesting because you know, me being you know, military, mm -hmm. I did my research on that. The Mini was created by a Frenchman, right? That is correct. And I think part of basic training, our version of basic training, I think they had to fire, they had to load and fire free within a minute for the first sergeant or whoever it was to say, okay, you passed, you can go on. Am I right? Uh, actually, you've got some, some of it's correct. Let me okay. tell you what it is. Uh, the best of the riflemen mm -hmm. could load and fire this weapon approximately three times in a minute. Thank you. That, that, that was the best that you could possibly do. That would be a person that's very coordinated, very skilled with their weapon, three times in a minute. 
Now, we know today, we know what types of weapons our, our soldiers carry today. That, that's almost funny. It's almost ridiculous. But at the time, a, a, a gentleman that could fire that gun three times in a minute was considered an excellent rifleman. Uh, and to be able to get that much lead down range, that was, that was significant. To put it in perspective further, this particular weapon as a, as a, uh, as a, uh, a rifled musket was good for up to, on a good day, maybe 200 meters. Uh, today, the weapons that our soldiers are carrying are good to about 500 meters, depending on what cartridge they're carrying and what gun they're carrying. Wow. But the idea is, you can understand, the, the, significant, imp the significant improvement in technology over the years. Yeah. The weapon that you see on the bottom was also a Civil War single-shot weapon. It was at Enfield and was typically carried by a Confederate soldier. The weapons look somewhat similar, and when you see them up close, you can make the comparison there. Um, the, the Confederate soldiers were more likely to carry a smoothbore gun. Smoothbore guns are not as accurate and don't shoot as far, okay? Uh, but as the war progressed, they, the, the Confederate soldiers were picking up the Springfield rifle muskets as battlefield pickups and whatever they could steal. And, uh, and, and they also were carrying the Enfields, the rifled Enfields, uh, which were also very fine firearms if they could get their hands on them. Over on this table over here, we have some of the lesser known or the less popular firearms that were used on a battlefield. If, you, if, if all the men in this room were all Civil War soldiers, uh, probably most of us wouldn't have seen any of these uh, it, because, they were so, uh, because they were so rare. I'll talk about two of these because the other two are just kind of a novelty. Uh, this particular weapon here, and I was showing this to the mayor before the, the session, this is a Spencer carbine, and uh, this, this weapon was significant in that it was able to fire a cartridge uh, as opposed to having to be loaded from the bore. It held seven cartridges, Ooh. and the, the soldier would hold the gun like this. He would turn it upside down, and he would flip this little door out, and out came this tube. All of the cartridges were actually loaded through the buttstock. Ooh. They would close. They would put this in and close it up like that. Then they would, I'm going to turn this way. I, unfortunately, I have to do this because I don't want to be pointing this at you. Uh, this lever would be pulled down, which would cause one of the cartridges that were loaded through the buttstock to come up and be loaded into the chamber. When it was, then all they would do is cock this gun to two clicks, and it was ready to fire. And it held seven cartridges, which is a significant improvement over a single-shot muzzle-loaded gun. Uh, the gun shot, a uh, uh, as I mentioned, a fully contained cartridge. We have some here today, and I'll hold them here where you can see them. Uh, these were a rimfire cartridge. For those of you that are familiar with uh, rimfires, this would be like the 22 caliber long rifle cartridges you might use for plinking or target practice or maybe hunting. These are just really, really the big grown-up on steroids size. That's what these are. They're very, very large. Uh, and that's the cartridge that was shot out of there. It wasn't a particularly strong cartridge because it was a rim fire. It was good for a, for a distance, but nothing more than what you saw with the rifled musket. Uh, the other one that you see here, give me a second, make sure I get the right one here. This is a Sharps. You've heard of a Sharps carbine. Yes. This was also a very, very popular weapon. This, was, this would have been a cavalry weapon. This would have been a cavalry weapon. It was, it was also, hmm? It's shorter. Because it's short, exactly. This actually has the ring here. See the ring? This was, to keep, this was to maintain the weapon so that it didn't fall off when you were galloping along carrying your rifle. I'm not sure anybody did that, but maybe they did. But that's what it was there for. Uh, this was also a cartridge weapon, but it was a single shot cartridge weapon. And so I'm not gonna demonstrate it because I'm not sure. Is this, can I open this? Yeah, I think it took a paper cartridge. Okay, it, it did. Okay. No, that wasn't supposed to happen, but it opens up the, the breech here and the cartridge actually loads from the back. And then when this is closed, you'll, know, you'll see the breech block come up. That comes up behind the cartridge. That's what holds the cartridge in place and keeps the cartridge from going backwards through your face, which would be very bad. Uh, and then it was uh, aimed and fired. The hammer had to be pulled all the way back and the uh, trigger was pulled and the gun would discharge. When you push this back down again, the cartridge would fall out. The empty casing would fall out. That's basically the uh, different firearms we have on display show here. Show them the Lee's carbine. Okay. okay. I'll show you one other one here that's unusual. You, you will not see another one of these. This is also, you can notice, this was also meant to be a, uh, 
uh, a cavalry weapon because it has this on it. This is meant for uh, retention in, on, in the saddle. But this gun is unusual in that uh, this gun swings to the, the barrel swings to the side. And I'll just show you what, it's for loading. Wow. Watch this. I don't know whether you can see this. I'll try to walk it back and forth here real quick. The barrel is swung to the side. Okay, that's unusual. Today you could go to any gun shop and buy a, a gun that tips down a single shot and you could load it that way. This one swings to the side. The tag here says that only a thousand of these were made, so the likelihood of any of us, if we were all soldiers together, seeing one of these, you're not going to see it. In fact, you're most likely not going to see this in any museums either because there was only a thousand made, so you figure how many of them even made it off the battlefield. So uh, this is a very unusual weapon. Uh, let me close it up here. It's very small and very light. We had a little hunter was here a little while ago. I don't see him here now, but uh, he, was young, he was five years old. He was able to hold this up, so you can imagine this is pretty light. I don't know what cartridge this fired, that part I don't know, but I can only imagine that if it had any heft to it at all, it'd probably shake your fillings loose when you pull the trigger because it really isn't all that heavy. Hmm. Is that an original uh, Civil War or is that yes. a it is indeed. Yeah. It is indeed. Yeah, all the weapons that you see up here, including the handguns down there, are all original Civil War era, Civil War battlefield firearms. Okay. Uh, you'll also notice here, we do have a set of binoculars. These binoculars, Joe can probably tell you more about them, but they'll look familiar to you. If anybody has binoculars for sightseeing or hunting, they look similar to what you would see. These are in exceedingly good shape. Uh, you can take a look at them when they're here, but these are the real thing. How old are they? Uh, according to this, 1861 to 1865. So they would be approximately 150 years old. Uh, Joe, do you want me to talk about the handguns while I'm here, or are you going to catch them later? I'll get, I'll get them now. Okay. I'll start. Let me talk. Go ahead and get yeah. stuff. I'll finish up the cannon sure. am ammunition. <laughs> we have a small amount of cannon uh, projectiles here for your observation. I will let you know that if you have an interest in artillery, uh, as this gentleman here does, we were speaking earlier, uh, if you have an interest in artillery, uh, I would recommend when you have a moment to stop at our museum when we're open again uh, and uh, see the projectiles we have on, on display because we have a very large display in comparison to what you see here. What you're seeing here is two, the two basic types of projectiles you would have seen on a Civil War battlefield. You would see a round projectile like this. This is essentially a billiard ball flying down through the air. This does not explode. This is nothing more than a big projectile flying at you. You can imagine the carnage it would cause, especially if you shot it in to a, a group of men together. It would be devastating. However, there were also cannonballs that exploded. This is a piece of one, all right? Now, here, I'll hand this to somebody here. You hold this here for a second. See how heavy that is, okay? You can imagine what the carnage this would cause if this hit you. It would just rip limbs off. It was awful. It was, as I said earlier, man had, at this juncture, had developed ways to kill each other in very efficient manner. We do it better today than we did then, but this was just devastating because these actually exploded. What we have here is a couple different rifle cannon projectiles. This particular projectile here looks sort of like a bullet. All right? This was placed into a rifle cannon and uh, it was very, very accurate. In the very end of it here, you'll notice there's something that looks like a screw head. You might be able to see it from where you are. If not, please look at it when you come up later on. Uh, that is actually a fuse, and the experienced artilleryman knew how to set this fuse so that this thing would explode at just the right moment downrange. Right. Uh, this would have been filled with some sort of explosive gunpowder, and uh, this would have fragmented like you see here. This is, a round, this is a round projectile, but it's the same sort of idea. This cast iron would go everywhere, and it was devastating. Wow. This stuff you see around the outside here looks kind of white. That actually was what grabbed the rifling and what allowed you the, uh, would, the, it grabbed the rifling and, and allowed you to aim that gun accurately. Uh, when you get into the round ammunition like this, you're basically getting, or in this case, you're getting iron in the air. That, that's what this is. The more the merrier. This is what they're looking for. Is get as lots of it down range. This is where you're aiming at something. Of course, there are other. This is a parrot round. This is slightly different. You'll notice it's still shaped like a bullet, but it looks kind of like a torpedo instead. 
once again, has a hole in the end for, the, uh, for a different kind of fuse. It's also going to explode, but it goes into a different kind of gun. If you've ever been to the Gettysburg battlefield and you uh, take notice, there's cannons all over the place, but none of them are the same. There's many different types there. There's parrot guns and smoothbore guns and bronze guns, and there's all kinds of guns down there, and they all shot different ammunition. As you can imagine, that was a logistical nightmare to try to keep them full of ammunition and gunpowder. Also fired out of the cannons, by the way, we do have fuses. Here, I'll show you one. This is actually one of the fuses, and you can see it. It's in this wooden box here when you go up. This is what a, one of the types of fuses looked like. Now, this looks like a marble. See it? This is actually fired out of a cannon also, but it was part of something called canister shot. Now, picture, uh, I don't think you, they sell it so much anymore, but remember when you used to be able to buy uh, uh, like tomato soup in a, in a can that was about this big around and about that tall? Remember you could buy tomato soup that way? Okay, picture the, the no tomato juice or tomato soup in there, but that can being full of these, okay? Now this thing's heavy. Here, take a hold of that. It, it's pretty heavy. You wouldn't, wanna, you wouldn't want me to throw that at your head. It would hurt. Um, they would fill that. It was canister. And when they put that down the barrel, it was like shooting a shotgun, except it was a really big shotgun. And it was used as an anti-personnel projectile because it would go out and spread out like a shotgun pattern and mow down men. And the thing about this projectile is it didn't stop on the first guy. It went into the second guy, or maybe even the third guy. Wow. So you can imagine that would be brutal. And whatever it hit, it shattered and tore. There, there were no clean wounds in the, in the Civil War. They didn't exist. Um, I think that's everything here, Joe. Uh, other than I'll mention, there are two bayonets here on display that you can look at. There are two different styles here. Now, they look very similar, you have to admit. They look very similar. But if you look at the ends of them, you can see that they are different. This one has three ribs, this one has four. And if you look, some of these match up with the holes in this canteen. <laughs> I'm, sure they weren't, they, I'm sure they weren't used on that canteen, but you get the idea. All right, Joe, go ahead. This is the original candle, Civil War candle. That's what they carried in the early part of the war when they had the pup tents and they'd stop for the night. If it was cold, they, two men would be sleeping in there and that would keep them warm and they could write or read letters. A little candle? But that's a Civil War. That is a, re that is a real candle. It wouldn't smell like potpourri if you lit it. <laughs> you going beyond that, Joe? No, just a little bit and I'll come back around here. I have two, this is an NCO sword, Civil War NCOs, NC, NCO sword. This is the same type of sword, and these were used up until the Spanish-American War. This sword was used in the Mexican War, the Civil War, and the Spanish-American War. I brought a couple of things I wanted to show you. This is a cutlass. This is a Spanish-American War cutlass. But I just wanted you to see what the cutlass looks like. There's people who have never laid their eyes on a, a cutlass unless they looked at a picture. But this was taken off of a Spanish-American ship during the Spanish. <laughs> it was in dry dock, and they went in there, and they found all these uh, swords and sabers and everything, and I was able to buy this off a good friend of mine from New York State. The thing you could remember about a cutlass, a cutlass is, is used by the Navy. So it would have been on a ship, as Joe mentioned. You wouldn't have seen that on, on a Gettysburg battlefield. That, wasn't, that wouldn't have been there, even though that one was from the Spanish-American War. This is one of the first swords that I bought. This is a sword. This here is a cavalry saber. This, this is a sword, this is a saber. When you see them bent, they're sabers. They were used in the cavalry. This one was a militia sword. And it was used before the Civil War and during the Civil War. 
I had two walking sticks here. One walking stick was made by a Civil War s soldier. He carved this. Now, this was carved, I, I'm pretty sure, after the war. But it's a snake on there. It's real pretty. His name's on there, and the G-A-R is on there. But this sword, I, not this sword, this uh, walking stick, I, I forget where I got this, but this was a piece of stick. During, uh, anybody that was in the service and was in the infantry, you know, on hikes and that, you'd cut a piece of stick and make a walking stick. This was made at the Battle of the Seven Days down near Richmond, this came from. Now, when I was stationed in Quantico, Virginia, I lived in Fredericksburg, Virginia. I was married as a PFC, which wasn't a smart thing. <laughs> back in them days, because you only got $104 a month to live on. And uh, I used to drive Route 1 up to Quantico, and the, they used to sell stuff along the way. And I stopped and went in this antique place, and this guy had all this wood. Well, they were going back in the Battle of the Wilderness, which was a, a woods, and they were cutting the trees down. They find these bullets in the trees. This bullet's been in there since 1863. I bought this for 50 cents. Now that, that put enough gas in my car to drive from Fredericksburg to Quantico and back home. <laughs> so it was a lot of money. And I, I, tr I wanted to buy more, but I just didn't have the money to do it. Now this got broke. Uh, this had a stem on it. This uh, from Lookout Mountain, Tennessee. A guy looked up after the battle and seen a bullet in the tree, so he cut it and made a pipe out of it, and that, that's been stuck in there since 1863. I have a jawbone here with teeth and everything in it, and I, uh, I, I can't remember where I got it. I bought a lot of my stuff and didn't keep track of it because, as you, we, you know, the, the wife wondered where you were doing with the money. <laughs> so, but later on, when I would buy, try to buy better stuff, I would make payments, like every, take me six, seven, eight months just to pay, make a payment on something I wanted to buy. But I'd start buying better stuff because uh, if you buy better stuff, it will, it will hold its value. You're going to talk about the pistols. I can. Okay. When they used to cut the legs and arms off of the soldiers, uh, they, a lot of times they had them bite down on a bullet. You'll see a lot of teeth marks in these bullets. Well, I took about 15 years ago, I took them to a, my dentist to check them over. There are no human teeth marks. They're all animals. You know, the deer and that grazing on the battlefield, they find us and they think it was something to eat. But at one time, our museum had several of, the, of, of bullets that had human teeth marks. He was a doctor. They had two members in our post that uh, were doctors during the Civil War. And, but uh, they vanished over the years. Wow. I have a piece of glass from a church in New Orleans that was bombarded. I also have a piece piece of brick from Stonewall Jackson's home in Lexington, Virginia. Now, I always bring these, these, these were made in 1869, uh, but I always brought them for the kids. They loved it. And they used to like you to take their, this was a cop, you know, you take it to jail. And they used to say, well, oh, that's easy to get out of. But if you take this and go real quick, you could break a guy's wrist. And he'll go down on his knees using it. So I always brought this to show it to the kids. And, you just and got it stuck, didn't you? I, I, come on. <laughs> they, they were, um, they loved it. <laughs> and I also have a piece of wood from a, 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 a hospital ship. Uh, These here were given to me back in the 60s. And I, they were in bad shape then. These are original cavalry boots. 
if you notice the heel and the sole isn't wore out, so he let the horse do his walking for him. This is a shaving kit. They would heat the water, put it in here, have the soap in here, and they had their razor. These pictures here are of Civil War soldiers from uh, downtown Scranton. And you'll see they have a cannon there. And we have that cannon in our Civil War Museum. And the, uh, that was built, the cannon, uh, not the, well, the carriage was built by the Civil War, uh, Civil War soldier who made wagons and, uh, for, you know, scrap before the automobile came along. It was actually built by a gentleman by the name of William Bloom. And uh, William Bloom and his family had a carriage company in Scranton. Uh, in fact, Joe found pictures of it, uh, uh, drawings of that particular building that they worked out of. They built this carriage that's still on display down there, and it was built specifically for uh, uh, for show. You wouldn't have, honestly, and I tell people when they come, if you would have loaded that cannon and lit it off, it would have launched itself right off the gun carriage because the gun carriage was for show. It was not for, for function. Great. If you saw the difference, if we were to see that next to a real gun carriage on a, uh, on a Civil War battlefield, it's minuscule. It's very small. But it got the point across when they were marching in patriotic parades. It had, a, it had not only the gun carriage, but it had the... What's the name of the box on it? Well, it's where they put their, um, the ammo and all. Caisson. Caisson. Well, yes, yeah. but uh, they had another name for it. I'll think of it in like when it's inappropriate. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'll think of it at the wrong time. But uh, we actually have it there, and uh, it was used for uh, specifically for um, patriotic days, like uh, like uh, Memorial Day. It was specifically used in parades then. Is anybody here familiar with South Gibson? There's a church up in South Gibson. Yeah. Over a little. A little uh, bridge and the church is there. Well, this is a picture of the church. And I went up there a long time ago, and here's the Civil War soldiers from that area sitting in front of that church. And them windows, that glass is still there. So I thought you'd like to see that. This here is state's money. And I bring this to show to the kids. Uh, $3, $8, $9 bill. This is state money. This was um, by the states. They had their own banks. I have some other artifacts here that was picked up on battlefields. Spoons, forks, and different things. Uh, some of the Civil War soldiers from Scranton. This is Joe Chapman. He's buried in Dalton, Pennsylvania. He was the last Civil War soldier from Lackawanna County to die. Wow. He was a hundred and I think 104 months old, and he had a grandson fighting in World War II. When did, Joe, when did he die? He died in 1943. Last one. Here's a, it's a Confederate money here for you to look at. It's very interesting. I brought this. These are sailors' uh, quartet that sang on the battleship Maine. When the Maine blew up in Havana Harbor, the, these, all these sailors were killed. They went down with the ship. So I thought you'd like to see this. These are the twilight years of our Civil War soldiers. These are from the early 30s. This is a twilight time of um, what we call our vanishing army. And we're right now in the twilight time of World War II vanishing army. And uh, we, that's what we do on Memorial Day to remember them all. And the men that came back from the war, and when they die, it's like dust blowing in the wind. Their stories are gone. These 
are one of the last formations of the Civil War soldiers. 1938 was the last year that they held their meeting. And this is Joe Chapman standing right here. These, this is, uh, I have it in print here. This is a Civil War document that tells you what the, what the uh, slaves sold for. And here's some more unusual money, a $2, a $1,000 bill, a $4 bill. $4. $4 bill. And uh, about 15 years ago, maybe longer, I had a chance to buy a $6 bill. And, and the guy wanted $35 for it. And I said, no, that's too much. And I could kick myself for not buying it. I wish I did. This here is issuing clothes to a Civil War soldier. And on one side, you'll see X, he couldn't read. On the other side, the one that was issued it could read and write, so he wrote his name. But it's very unusual if you want to look at this and see the X's. A man that he took, you know, went to fight for his country, he couldn't read. So what you know, like you to do if you want, if you have uh, any questions for us, if you want to come up before we put the stuff away and look at it and ask questions, we'll be more than happy to answer them. Joe, I'm going to talk about that to the hand yes. real quick, yes. and uh, then, we'll, then we can uh, invite the questions. We have a selection of handguns here, and the unusual part about it is uh, when you see movies uh, about the Civil War, typically any sidearm that's carried typically by an officer or an artilleryman is always going to be a revolver, and that wasn't always the case. Uh, some of the ones we have on display here, and I believe these are all from Joe's personal collection, are quite unusual. This particular gun, I'll just sh I'll start with this one. This gun is unusual. Now you'll notice, and I'm not going to point it at you, but you'll notice it's two barrels, upper and lower. Okay? This gun is very flat. If you look at it from the side here, you can see it's very, very flat. It's very, very slender. This gun was developed and made specifically for, in the boot, yeah. of a cavalryman. He had tall boots. The gun was relatively accessible right here. Now you have to figure this gun is gonna be very accurate at a very long distance. So this gun comes out when everything else is run dry because this gun isn't gonna to be too much good beyond a little wee distance, okay? You're not gonna be shooting down range with this. It's not gonna do you any good. This is for close up and personal. This gun, this revolver right here was ahead of its time. This is called a pin fire. This was a French design and it did appear on some of the Civil War battlefields. This is unusual because we usually saw cap and ball revolvers uh, portrayed in uh, both photographs and in the movies. You wouldn't see somebody carrying one of these, but they did appear on Civil War battlefields. The unusual thing about this firearm is that it held cartridges. It was not a, a, a cap and ball gun that had to be loaded one cylinder at a time. This gun actually held cartridges, which are on display here. I won't put them in there right now. How many? It held six. six? Yeah, it was six. This is actually a pretty, a pretty advanced weapon for its time in that the cartridges were self-contained, and uh, they did have a primer in them, but the primer was a pin. Instead of being a primer in the back of the cartridge, it was on the side. To, you'd have to see it up here to understand, but there is a machine notch in every one of these cylinders, and that's where the pin stuck out. The hammer actually hit the pin, drove it down into the cartridge, which lit the cartridge off, created the gas that put, pushed the projectile out. This gun was way ahead of its time. Now, you wouldn't have seen a lot of them, but the ones, the people that would have had them would have never wanted to part with them. There are several other guns here. This is a, you'll notice this gun looks similar to the, the lock work on the uh, Springfield rifle musket. It's very similar because it works the same. This gun has to be loaded from the front, okay? This gun is kind of big for what you get out of it. It's, uh, it is a single shot. There is a ramrod here that's used to, push the car, used to push the projectile down on top of the powder. It does require, I'm not gonna pull that back because it feels kind of tight. Uh, this does require a cartridge or a, um, a cap here to ignite the gun. And uh, consequently, this gun here probably wouldn't, be, wouldn't have been tremendously popular because you get one shot and then it becomes a club. There is one other gun here I'll call attention to. This one is unusual. A couple different gentlemen noticed this. Um, this, and I'll hold it up this way so you can see it, there is four barrels on this gun. 
Okay. Now this is a close up. This is a this is a vest pocket gun. Uh, once again, this is a everything else ran dry, and I need at least four more shots. Uh, this is, actually fires a 22 short. Okay. Now you can still buy that ammunition today. You wouldn't want to fire it out of this, but you could still buy that ammunition today. The unusual part about this gun is to load it. You push this button and pull the barrels forward. If you watch here, I'll show you. The barrels actually slide forward, and the cartridges load in the backs of the barrels, and then it closes like that. Now, unfortunately, as Joe has told the story, I've heard it before, this gun was damaged in a, in a display uh, several years ago. Uh, a young student picked it up and cocked it too hard and actually froze the hammer back like that. It needs to be taken apart by a gunsmith. It's just never been done. Uh, but the hammer is frozen in this particular position. Normally, that would have been put forward. It is a rim fire, so that means that the, uh, the firing pin on the, uh, on the hammer has to change positions. And if you were to see it up close, and you can look at it when you come up, it actually has a rotating head on it. You actually turn it. That's how you get to the different, car the, to the different barrels. Yes, sir? Oh, is that a, like, like a Derringer? You could think of it like a Derringer. It, it, uh, you know what a vest looks like, uh, yeah. like a gambler's vest? It would actually fit like right here. Yeah. I mean, you could hide it anywhere you want, yeah. but it's not much use if you put it in your shoe. No. Uh, do you see what I'm saying? Uh, but if it was in here, it would we be very useful. Do you have a Derringer? Yes. One, you, have a, you have a small, yeah, okay. Yeah, That's a gambler's pistol. Yeah, yeah gambler's pistol. Th this is the same sort of idea, but this is a one and done pistol here. Same idea. Uh, uh, single shot, this, you're going to pull this out of a boot or out of a, your waistband or someplace like that. You get one shot. You, you don't want to shoot this more than about five or ten feet because then it's just spray and pray. <laughs> you got to hope you hit something with it. Uh, so this was a, this was a last ditch effort when everything else had run by. Same idea, same idea, except this one doesn't hold nearly enough cartridges. <laughs> it's actually not a cartridge gun anyway. Scott, give me that other pistol in the front, uh, up there now. This one? Yeah. Okay. Is it this one? No, it's, it's the other one. All right. That was the one I was holding earlier. Yeah. Okay, one more thing. And it, what, this one more thing. I bought this pistol for two bucks. Mm -hmm. Off a of Marine. Off a of Marine? In, in North Carolina, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. He's going on liberty. And he's going to meet this girl. Mm -hmm. So he sold this to me for two bucks so he could go meet this girl. And uh, I was on the uh, uh, division rifle and pistol team, and I took this pistol up to the armor, and he cleaned it. And we took it over to pistol range and fired it. I actually fired this pistol. I, I aimed in at 5 o'clock to hit the bullseye. So whenever I aimed this pistol, I aimed it at 5 o'clock on the... On okay, let, just, just, so, just so Joe's analogy could be understood. Yeah. Uh, if this is the bullseye he was shooting with, he couldn't aim here in the middle to hit the bullseye. He had to, hit, he had to aim down here to hit up here. Yo. Yeah, so you learn your weapons, but that, that's... But uh, I'm so proud of this. <laughs> oh, sure. All right, now, uh, now that we've said those different things, uh, is there any questions we can answer for you or any questions you might have about anything we can take a wild guess at? Anybody have any questions? If you'd like to come up and look. We welcome we, to come up and look. Yeah, we would like you to come up as you as you as you're finished here. Uh, come up and look at the things up close because you've been sitting back a ways. You can't see these things very closely from back there. But up close, there, there, these are some of the things that you will not see in another museum anywhere. Period. So it, there is a good a lot. Uh, there's a lot of things here to see, and we'd welcome you to come up. And we thank you very much for coming tonight. That's not what I'm trying to get. Yeah.
That's a clean cut. That's a bayonet. The Civil War bayonet later on. It was on the right. Yes. Wait, because this is a Austria. Yeah. That's the way it was back then. Yeah. But that's a nice. I mean, thank you. It's very interesting. Yeah, what is it, a buckle? I see yeah. Confederate States naval dog. Oh, I see that. I see the anchor. Confederate still had a big name. Yeah. Very small. Very small. Hours. Thank God my ex wife was very patient with me. Because she knew she's a history buff too. But not like me. Well, Ted, I see him. What do you think, Lou? Pretty interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. 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 Yeah.